It was a few months after I got out of the hospital, I first came in contact with Dr. Stein. I was watching a television program, and uh, they were showing electronic arms and hands and so forth. And I was so interested that I decided to call him and find out if I could get on their research program. And Working with Dr. Stein at the University of Alberta's Department of Physiology was an old friend of Hank's, Dean Charles. Hank heard that we were fitting people with electric hands here at the University of Alberta and was very interested in being fitted with such a hand. It turned out, though, that when we tried to fit Hank with a hand, what Hank really wanted was to be able to play the saxophone. So I called in two friends of mine to help. Mr. Kelly James, who's a very fine mechanical engineer, and Mr. Robin Taylor, who's an expert on the saxophone. What would the minimum number of keys be? The three primary keys that he can't play with his left hand are these three here. And those would represent what notes? Um, C, D, A, and G. A crucial component that was missing from our concept of operating the saxophone without fingers is something which, when an electrical impulse arrives, will move in and drive the key closed. Such a thing is called a solenoid. When there's an electrical impulse applied to the coil, the core is driven sideways just like a finger pressing on the key of the saxophone. We wanted to test to make absolutely sure that the skin conducts enough electricity to operate this control device. So we put two pennies on the bench. And when you touch the two pennies to each other with your fingers so that they'll conduct from one finger to the other, lo and behold, the solenoid is activated and drives the key of the saxophone almost exactly the same way as a finger would. We decided we'd have to make up um, prosthetic shell which would fit around Hank's left stump. Each one of these metal points represents those penny contacts that we were using for the preliminary tests. Okay. These are the contact points inside the prosthetic shell. Each point is a tiny electrode that Hank can touch with the stump of his arm. When the contacts are touched, an electrical impulse travels to a special decoder and then to the solenoids on the saxophone which physically depress the keys. When the whole project was finished, nobody knew if it would work or if it wouldn't work. So it was with a lot of skepticism that I took the saxophone to Hank DeMarco in San Diego. <laughs> well, I brought this thing, and, uh... Oh, well, that's fantastic. Well, that's great. Okay, I'm going to clip this on the stand here for you. You got it? Yep. This is your control box. You just plug the saxophone into this one here that's marked instrument. Now there's power going out to the solenoids. Right. Okay, Hank, this is the prosthesis section. Okay. So you slip that on, okay. see whether or not you can make a contact with this. That's the target. Right. Right. I'm going to plug you into your prosthesis, like so, which is the signals coming from you, and turn the unit on. This is one of your contacts right here. And when you touch it with your stump, it should create a contact. I got one note and another note and all of a sudden I got this strange feeling that it was going to stop working. I could feel like I could find where the keys were. just beautiful. I know Hank DeMarco is the only saxophone player in the world who plays a bionic saxophone, but the main reason for the success is Hank's musical ability, but more important than anything else, his belief, his drive, and his tremendous determination to play again, his motivation, that's what does it. It wasn't long before Hank decided to try performing again, so he contacted his old friend, Patty James, who is now also in California. That's why I'm a lady That's why I'm a lady That's why this lady is so 
notes. 